everyone and welcome or welcome back to Blaina's Pages. Today we're talking about a much requested poem, The Lama's Hireling. This is another video in my Edexcel A-level English Literature series, so let's dive straight in. The Lama's Hireling is a dramatic poem based around Northern Irish folklore, more specifically about a festival, the Lamas. During this Lamas harvest, a farmer is trying to hire some help to help him with this new harvest and he's hiring a young man. And at first everything seems to be going well, they're enjoying each other's company, he's enjoying having a male presence around, but then he catches the young boy with his wife mid-transformation and he kills him with a gunshot. But we are unsure if he really killed him because the phrasing is very ambiguous and the poem switches to present tense where the farmer is confessing his sins to a priest. So the themes explored here are sin, guilt, lust, and I suppose gender roles. This poem is quite different from the others on the list in that it feels much older. It doesn't really feel like a modern poem, but I suppose it's because it centers around superstition and folklore, so it very much matches the time that it's trying to <laughs> explore. So it's written from first-person narration, but it's not necessarily from the perspective of the poet. It's half fictionalized, half real, so it could be compared to Giuseppe, which is also a similar poem in that it explores the supernatural themes. It can also be compared to The Gun or maybe Eat Me, and other similar poems like The Deliverer. After the fair, I'd still a light heart and a heavy purse. He struck so cheap, and cattle doted on him. In his time, mine only dropped hafers at a scream. Yields doubled. I grew fond of company that knew when to shut up. Then, one night, so the title of the poem, The Lammas Hireling, it sounds quite old-fashioned. It's a reference to the North Anglo-Saxon world with the Harvest Festival. It's potentially an allusion to paganism rather than Christianity, but then we see that there's a confession to a Christian priest after all, so it adds an, just another level of ambiguity. Every stanza has an enjambment, so there's no order and no structure, although it may first appear that there is a structure, again highlighting how unreliable he is. There's no clear rhyme, there's no clear meter, and this reflects how the poem is not fully what we expect and it doesn't give us a sense of stability because a confession is usually something that we believe to be true because, I mean, if you're going to confess, why would you lie as well? So we expect that everything that he has told us is true, but the story itself is just so fantastically unbelievable that it makes it hard for us to really fully resonate with the characters and take it as the truth. And when we talk about the hireling, so he seems to be the center of the poem, the lamb is hireling, it's all about him, but we really get to know him through the descriptions of others of him, so it suggests that he's a very elusive persona, he's there but he's not quite there, so all we know is that under him yields doubled and that the farmer likes his company and that he spent time with his wife, but we don't really much, we don't really know much beyond that. And there's a juxtaposition here between light heart and heavy purse. So light meaning like light consciousness, no doubt, no issues. He's very easy, very easygoing. He's just so happy to have found someone who's struck, struck so cheap. And heavy, heavy purse, so he's he has a lot of money, it's very symbolic of his financial power, of his status, so he's this very like rough farmer that everyone respects, so he goes off to hire this young help, which is why he can't take it when he sees the young help with his wife, even if they're not necessarily doing something sinful, because it's his reputation on the line, he sees himself with his heavy purse as like the ultimate man of power, and then we see that the lamb is hireling also has power over him, even though it's not financial power. So it highlights that financial power is not really everything in this poem. There are more important things like magic at play that we just don't understand. So you could also compare, uh, you could also see it as a comment on materialism in general and compare it to other poetry, like for example, Ode on a Grace and Fairy Urn. So the hireling has an easy relationship with animals, the cattle dote on him, so they like him, they feel affectionate towards him. The use of words from the semantic field of love and attraction here, they give the reader a sign that perhaps there are homosexual relationships at play, or perhaps relationships between the hireling and the wife. It's Again, it's very ambiguous, there's a lot of hints, but there's a secret repressed sexual desire that later spills into into violence, so perhaps the poem is a, is a comment on how you can't really suppress that side of yourself for Forever, much like the hireling can suppress his animal side eventually when he transforms under the moon and likewise the farmer just can't handle that he has a side that's per that doesn't suit his persona of this perfect 
financial, the breadwinner essentially, this perfect financial icon that takes care of his wife and others around him. The cattle doted in his time, so there's a focus on the hireling whenever he's there, the bone rolls around his presence, around his existence. Even when he's dead, the farmer can't let him go. So again, if we're looking at this through the lens of homosexual relationships, this could be the fact that Although he's trying to repress the side, he can't, and although he claims that he has killed the side, it still comes back to haunt him. He still sits there with his gun, waiting to find the hireling. And we talked about the symbol of the gun in Vicky Fever's poem, but essentially the gun could be a phallic symbol. So it's a symbol of his masculinity and what he feels is tension between his masculinity and his essential like desires that he doesn't feel are masculine, that he doesn't feel conform to what, is, what society expects of him. The cows produce heifers, fat as cream, so the simile highlights luxury and wealth. So potentially instead of thinking of the moral side, he instead focuses on the materialistic, on what this young help is doing for him, which is bringing him profit, doubling his yields. So he's very willing to ignore the other sides of him, the more Mm, something doesn't seem right here sides of him. So this could also be a commentary on spiritualism and materialism. And given that it revolves around folklore, I think that was quite the moral essentially that in most folklore tales, people are punished when they put their own personal gain above what they know is good and right. So again, if we're talking religious conflicts between perhaps paganism and Christianity, choosing paganism because it's more comfortable, it's more free over, for example, choosing Christianity, which has far more rules and far more kind of obligations that are expected from you. The speaker likes the hireling's presence, it is contrasted to the wife's present because he know he knew when to shut up. So the speaker likes the tense silence between him and the hireling, again like this tense sexual relationship where they feel a lot of feelings towards each other but they don't want to act so it's this like tense silence where you're just waiting for the next person to make the move so again it could be a reference to that and perhaps it goes even further suggesting that they have already had the affair but it lasted longer than the farmer's other affairs for example because he the hireling knew not to talk about it, knew not to reveal not to reveal it. And going back to the theme of confession and kind of sinning, which goes through the entirety of the poem, we could see this as like, oh, he has sinned before, so this time it's just another type of sin, but except for just letting the affair go, this time he has actually killed him to make sure that the affair is not known, or perhaps because he saw the hireling with his wife. Because I think the farmer represents a very traditional stereotypic male figure in that he, he he wants to be like this stereotypical man, he wants to be the breadwinner, but he also wants to have fun, I think, so he can't stand the notion that his wife wants someone else, not him, to be with in a in a like inner relationship, but he himself wants side flings, side relationships. So that's what the hireling is for him. It's more than just a repressal of like homoeroticism. It's a repressal of essentially his masculinity when he sees that he wants to have other partners, but he's not allowing his wife to do the same. Disturbed from dreams of my dear late wife, I hunted down her torn voice to a spale form, stock still in the light from the dark lantern. Stark naked, but for one fox trap biting his ankle, I knew him a warlock, a cow with leather horns, to go into the hair gets you muckle sorrow. Disturbed from dreams. So there's an alliteration, there's stop, it sounds D, dear late wife, it's quite disturbing, no pun intended, because we usually say like dear late when there's somebody who's dead. So again, did he not only kill the Lamas Harding, but did he also kill his wife perhaps because of their affair? Disturbed is like the start of the stanza, so there's an emphasis on the chaotic nature of the events. This contributes to the tension we have felt throughout this entire poem. So if you get a question on tension, on suspense, I would definitely highlight how the sounds of each words contribute to this overall feeling of, oh, what's going on? Because especially because of this ambiguity, the poem is very uncertain. There's layers upon layers. And when you analyze, it's hard to pick just like one pathway to follow. So I think it's interesting to explore just how the poet makes it so multi-layered. He hunts down her torn voice. So she could be moaning if they're engaging in a sexual scene and the hyaline is stock still and stark naked. So it's contrasted. And I, again, I think it's a contrast between like the masculine and the feminine energy, the gender roles. So if we are comparing it to, for example, why the farmer might feel towards towards 
the hiding essentially because he feels like it's another part of himself maybe it's an like an ego like a shadow version of himself so there's different layers to it and different personas so perhaps the farmer sees himself as the lamas hiding in another persona as not quite belonging to this world so when he kills it when he kills the lamas hiding he kills off that part of himself and he chooses to conform to society and that's why when he that's why he confesses to the priest embracing christianity the norm of the time and just embracing the culture and the expectations of society in general. And there's animalistic behavior, almost as if the Lamas Hiring is somewhere between the human and the animal world. This is emphasized by the light from a dark lantern. So this is an oxymoron. Again, it demonstrates the impossibility of the, event, of the events. It almost seems like it's a dream. So were the Lamas Hiring and the wife actually together? Or was it the farmer's worst nightmare to have his affair sleep with his wife and that's why he can't handle it and he ends up going crazy and shooting them both. Uh, he realizes uh, he's naked, but the personification of a fox trap biting him. So he realizes he knew this hireling as a warlock, a male witch, a hare. So the heir is a the hare is a popular figure in legends and riddles from Irish folklore. And this line about muckle sorrow. So it's quite ironic because like the harvest leads to sorrow, and usually harvests would be sources of joy because of course when you're living the farm life you're essentially like feeding yourself so everything you grow is everything that you eat so it's all about sustenance so usually the like the Lamas festival would be a time of great joy because there would be wheat and there would be a lot of harvest and you wouldn't go hungry and it would be all about being like plentiful and joy and like all of those kind of values and here we see that instead it brings like muckle sorrow so instead of the joy it brings well sorrow <laughs> and perhaps also pushed by a passion of remembering his dead wife, that's when he stumbles onto the scene, that's when he feels the passion and lets go of his emotions. He kills the hireling maybe because it's jealous or maybe because he cares for one party, either the wife or the hireling more. We don't know why he kills them, we just know that he's confessing to the priest. Or perhaps by having a sexual dream about the hireling and admitting to himself that he likes their tense silence because of other reasons, he realizes that this is illicit and that's why he wants to kill it, kill it all to kill the sin in its early stages. The wisdom runs, Muckle Care. I leveled and blew the small hour through his heart. The moon came out. By its yellow witness I saw him fur over like a stone mossing. His, lo his lovely head thinned, his top lip gathered, his eyes rose like bread. I carried him. So an old wi Celtic wisdom is that Muckle Care causing sorrow, that is that practicing witchcraft and sort of using forces that you don't understand will bring no good. And this is affirmed as the speaker kills the lamb as hireling and it symbolizes like the new beginning of dark times for the harvest levels and it implies that he's fully unstable. He's driven off the edge by this very action. And as soon as he shoots him, the moon comes out like illuminating his crime, acting as a witness. And we talked quite a lot on this channel about what the moon symbolizes, how it's a symbol of purity, and when it illuminates, it illuminates all crime. So because it's so pure, it kind of exposes all the darkness. It's the soul light in the night. So the moon comes and it shows him his true crimes and he recognizes his true nature and he realizes that there's no turning back. And under the moon, the hireling becomes covered with fur like a stone mossing. So the simile shows how quickly the fur spread over his body, almost like moss over a stone. And again, this very specific choice of similes that date back to nature show how the Lamas hireling is more a part of nature rather than a part of society. So he conforms to like the true beliefs rather than the man-made beliefs. The descriptions of the Lamas hireling are almost sensual. His lovely head becomes thinner, his top lip gathers. So lovely head, again, even here the farmer focuses on his head and on his top lip. So again, the lips are something very sensual, something very romantic because it suggests kissing. So he's very focused on those parts of the lamb as hireling rather than his body or his gunshot wound because he has shot him. And simile of like bread jolts us back to life because it's a very mundane simile, but it, it also brings us back to his eyes rising like bread. So the lamb as hireling is shot that his lover has betrayed him or just in general that he has been shot by the farmer because he thought that they had a good relationship going on, that they trusted each other, but ultimately the farmer embraced society over nature. And this helps the speaker justify the action as it seems that, oh well, 
it was just a monster anyway, so he doesn't see the, the hireling as human anymore, but as a warlock, as a hare. And the moon illuminates the truth that he's just trying to justify it, but he has committed a sin. In a sack that grew lighter at every step and dropped him from a bridge, there was no splash, now my herd's elf shot. I don't dream, but spend my nights casting ball from half crowns and my days here. Bless me, father, for I have sinned. It has been an hour since my last confession. It's almost like with every step the Lama's Hyling disappears, he returns to his mystical spirit. He becomes less and less sure, and as this progresses we become less and less sure of the narrator's sanity just as he becomes less and less sure of whether he killed the Lama's Hyling or not. Because when he drops the bag it makes no splash, it suggests that he disappeared completely. Has all of this even happened in the first place? There's no evidence of him ever existing. With the splash, with this onomatopoeia, we wipe out the guilt and we wipe out the certainty as the narrator takes one step closer towards losing his sanity. Elfshot means cursed, so with the disappearing hair, with the hireling, the link between the human world and the animal world is wiped out. He's cursed to forever be doomed to think over whether this happened or not, whether it was all in his imagination. And he doesn't dream, so his consciousness is not fully calm. It haunts his dreams all the time. He's focused only on this and he can't really rest in peace knowing that he has committed this sin. Or maybe he hasn't. So half crowns are like silver half crowns. They're a symbol for bullets. So like I said, he's sitting there making bullets for his gun. He spends all his life focusing on what to do if the Lama's Harley comes back. So what to do if the repercussions come back. So he sits there wallowing in regret. Perhaps not only because he has killed someone, but perhaps because he has repressed a side of himself that he didn't want to repress after all. The final line is quite disturbing. He says, bless me father. So this is a confession, but it's only been an hour since he last did something terrible. And we're left to question whether that last something terrible was his wife or perhaps this isn't the first time he's encountered a warlock. So this suggests that it's routine for him, that he's stuck in this terrible cycle of sinning and then trying to like <laughs> repent for his sins, but then sinning again, showing that no matter what he does, He's still really haunted by his past and by his actions, showing that you can't fully repress that part of yourself, so it could be a commentary on that. Or that you can't just choose one part of yourself. You have to embrace all parts of yourself, you have to embrace your outer egos too. So that side that longs to be with nature, and that side that longs to be with society, they both have a place to be and you can't just kill one off completely. So The Lama's Hireling is a fascinating poem in terms of its complexity, so I hope you enjoyed this video and that it was helpful in providing you just some opinions on, on what this poem is about and how you can see it. So thank you so much for watching, please leave a like and a comment if this helped, and I'll see you next time!